Hello and welcome to episode seven of Earth Star Talk. Today I have a very, very special guest and that is Lon Strickler. And I had the privilege to talk with him uh, already an hour before the show and I can tell you, oh boy, what an interesting man. So welcome Lon and uh, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Claudia. Uh, as I said, we talked already already an hour before the show and I wish it would have been recorded, but unfortunately that didn't work out that well. <laughs> so um, we are going to dive right into things. And what I found most fascinating was a encounter Lon had when he was younger and what got him on the path of his research because Lon is a paranormal investigator, author of many, many books, bestseller on Amazon. You have to check them out there. I will have um, links in the description box. And uh, he has a wonderful blog who, um, where he talks about phantoms and monsters and which is attended by thousands and thousands of people who are interested in the material. He has been uh, featured on numerous TV shows, History Channel, and also Destinated Nation America. I mean, fascinating men. So um, let's dive into your own experiences. How did you start? Well, I was, uh, you know, I noticed when I was younger that uh, I had, I was a little bit different than other kids. I was, you know, I was able to sense things which I really didn't know what I was sensing. You know, it was just bizarre. And um, I used to spend a lot of time on the Gettysburg battlefield as a kid. And during the summers, I would take my bike and ride out to the battlefield from home. And I'd spend many hours out there. I was, <laughs> I was interested in history as a kid. And uh, so I got to an area of the battlefield known as the, death, the Valley of Death, which is between Little Round Top devil's den and the wheat field oh that gives me chills <laughs> <laughs> and i was um i was just riding on my riding my bike and all of a sudden it was like a huge television screen opened up in front of me and i just suddenly was taken back in time i believe to where i was actually hearing gunfire and cannon fire and smelling gunpowder and seeing soldiers and i mean a whole nine year all my sight all my senses were opened to what was going on and um uh, you know i was mesmerized i didn't know what i was seeing and uh it, it lasted for about 30 seconds and then it just suddenly quit i mean it ended and you know i'm wondering what am i seeing what did i see well that was actually the first time i really realized that you know I, you know i've got probably some ability i mean i'm nine years old this is back in 1967 and um you know you're a kid you, you, you weren't raised in a haunted house you know your parents don't know any of this i never really talked to them about it at all i don't know if they knew i had abilities or something was different they never mentioned it so you know they were very faith-based folks and um you know, so we just never talked about it. So I was kind of left on my own volition on the, at that point. Well, I know how that goes. Um, <laughs> but I want to uh, hook back into this television screen line experience. First yeah. of all, um, do you think that you were tuning into another person's body, uh, body and time and space and might have looked through some of these people's eyes? Or do you think you were just a spectator out of time and space, having opened a window and were allowed to view it like a remote viewing, but not looking through somebody else's eyes? Yeah, I think that may have been what happened. It was like, um, you know, I didn't really feel like I was watching it as another person. I, I felt like it was kind of a, a panorama of what was going on all around me. And like a, uh, maybe a doorway had opened up of some type, you know, I wasn't really quite sure, but it was quite vivid. You know, I, like I said, I heard everything. You know, I smelled the gunpowder and such, I heard screams, yells, you know, what you would expect in a, a 19th century battle scene. It was just 
bizarre, but wow. here I am standing right in the middle of it. So um, that yeah, would be I mean, shocking kinda, to me too. <laughs> yeah, it kind of put put everything in perspective. Like I said, I was a you know I liked history as a kid, so I just got a you know a front row seat as to what happened that day, and uh, you know that you know so there there you go you know you take it any way you want to, but you know at that point I I I knew something was up. I mean I, you know I could in the, in the thing I did learn not long after that it was um, I was able to sense spirit energy around me and in my situation it's somewhat different because my mind's eye flashes certain colors when I'm around energy spirit energy like pink and foam green I don't know what that is with these two colors but they just show up and when that happens I know I'm around something or something's around me and uh, I, that still occurs Wow, that is fascinating because that means you have an inner vision attuned to frequency levels and morphogenetic fields and such. Yeah. And it looks like you're fine tuned to A, maybe cosmic love, you know, pink, but also be the sea foam or uh, blue green as a frequency of either protection or just knowledge, you know, communication in between the worlds. Very fascinating. Yeah, you know, in, in that, that happened many times and, and still happens on occasion. Uh, and, and when I notice that, I, I know I'm around some type of spirit, some type of energy. And uh, it's just up to me to figure out what's going on. You know, you know, many times, many times these, these, these spirits will just contact me. And I think they just want me to know they're there. They just want to communicate. Uh I, I call it I I call it astral chatter for for lack of a better name, uh, and a lot of times it happens when I'm say, I'm laying down getting ready to go to sleep, and it's like a, a wind. I'm looking in a window and I see faces come in, and I hear voices. So, wow, yeah, that's yeah. exactly how that happens to me too. Sometimes. Oh when really? I sleep. I focus on my third eye to yeah. you know zone out. And there they are, like a window opening, and you know, you see extraterrestrials and these and that, and old people, young people, and sometimes even I wonder what it all is. But then I ask uh, consciously, is anybody wanting to talk? And then uh, sometimes we have a conversation. But please forgive me, I want to just talk in quite briefly mm -hmm. into a personal experience which I had about time and space being a relative thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was having a a uh, teacher who wanted to give me a bad grade because I was a female in a former only boys and Catholic schools. We were the, the boys schools, or we were the first girls in a class where we're just Catholic boys before. So these, these teachers were honed in on no women at school. Right. And the teacher told me, even though I was a, a grade A student, like you will not have that with me. So I, it was an AP class. I learned and learned and learned and was pretty desperate because that could have ruined my then career. And um, lo and behold, when I was the most tired and most sad about the situation, a door opened up um, in my uh, wall and a woman looking like me looked out and said, oh, don't worry about it. You're going to live in America and you're going to be married and have a dog and everything. Life is good. And don't worry about that man. So that let me go to sleep. And uh, when I came here to America, I remember distinctively sitting with my husband and I'm looking to the side, thinking about myself and seeing myself laying in bed and feeling this mental thoughts come up. Oh, don't worry about it. You know, it, you will be happy and so on and so forth. So that was a very distinctive moment. And I do not know what started this loophole in time and space. Maybe my call out for help, maybe desperation. I do not know, but for you, probably a curiosity, what happened here, sensing spirits, and maybe that opened the gateway uh, because there was an intent there. Yeah, for right. me, it was an intent in the old times to have help, but for you, most likely the intent of um, experiencing what was there, was happening, what you couldn't perceive with your extrasensory perception. Mm -hmm. Talking about your extrasensory perception, 
you had done extensive research on winged creatures and cryptides and all sorts of, as you say, uh, phantoms and monsters. So um, tell us a little bit about your recent investigations. I was focusing on some of those interviews with you where you talked about the O'Hare Airport. Tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that if you don't get bored by it now. By now. <laughs> Okay. I, um, you know, this all really started for me back in 2011. There were three sightings in South Chicago. And uh, there was a bit of a hoopla about it back then. But, you know, that kind of quickly faded out as time went by. So in, uh, in uh, the spring of 2017, there were reports were starting to come in through MUFON um, of people seeing these winged beings. And, um, of course, because of MUFON not giving out any type of information, we, we literally had to track these people down ourselves. So the folks that were living in Chicago who were working with me, they, they tracked one or two of them down. And we started getting enough information as to where we started figuring out what was going on. You know, the reports over MUFON were kind of vague. So uh, as we got these reports, we started uh, looking deeper into it, and it, it got to, actually it got to the point where I put a I put an ad on on Google online to uh, uh, if people had reports of these these beings that they contact me, and it didn't take long because we started getting contact with with people, and um, you know th these reports were you know some of them were a little hair raising. But for the overall, I think the people kind of took it very well in stride. I mean, they didn't seem to be too affected by it. Like I had mentioned many times, it was like they um, they were picked to uh, to be you know be seeing these type of beings. And for the most part, the sightings uh, and, and as they are they're being seen today were like a five to six foot tall dark colored, sometimes looking even wet or shiny like being with arms and legs and a, uh, and a wing structure that was like that of a bat over gargoyle. Now, sometimes the arms were attached to the wings or the arms, so many times they were unattached. They were just out on their own. Uh, and, and many of the settings involved uh, red eyes as well. Uh, most of the, the beings were seen with these, um, these small, narrow heads with these large red eyes, very bright red eyes, actually. And uh, they would be fleeting sightings. They would show up all of a sudden. And uh, a matter of seconds and make themselves known, then suddenly they'd go. I mean, they'd take off somewhere quickly. And they wouldn't, you know, the witness wouldn't know where it went to. And there was, it just left them no time to grab a camera and to take a photograph. You know, you got over the shock by that time it was gone. So we were getting a lot of these. I mean, it, it was like I was getting two to three a week for a long time. Wow. And, uh, you know, I wasn't the only one getting them. My, my colleagues were getting them as well. So, uh you know, we got deeper and deeper into it. And uh, as time has gone by, this, many of the sightings started branching out from the city. But in particular, around October 2000, excuse me, October 2019, we started getting sightings in or around O'Hare International. And uh, it, we were baffled, actually. We, we, and we still are, in a way. Uh, we didn't know why these sightings were concentrated around the airport. Um, you know, Harris had a history of a lot of UFO activity, a lot of strange paranormal activity. Occasionally you would hear something where somebody had seen something at some point, but the fact that these winged beings were showing up there and later on in particular around a particular cemetery, Rest Haven Cemetery, that was actually there when the airport was was built and for whatever reason it was allowed to stay there and you know i've always thought that was somewhat odd i don't i didn't know what the situation was why the air you know the cemetery was in the middle of an airport makes you uh, wonder what was buried there especially when there is so much sightings around that air um that um cemetery 
because sometimes yeah, it's bizarre. high it's bizarre. Uh, vibrational beings use it like an anchor. You know, if something is there, could be also maybe ley lines that have created a portal, you know, cross uh, over ley lines, but right. do that as a gate um, or rift in time and space. Well, many of us felt that this cemetery was was a key to what was going on. Now, you know, uh, until recently we had a sighting back in July 22nd that was seen by a lot of witnesses. And there's been a lot of press about it as well. And uh, when I got to, you know, I started looking at the location of this sighting compared to others. We've had about six sightings uh, that have been within 100 yards of that cemetery now. You know, as big as O'Hare is, you start to wonder what well, something's going on here. And um, I, I am positive from just just the work we've done that there are a series of ley lines that actually intersect at that cemetery. So, of course, if they're ley lines, they're moving out past the airport into the city. So I, I believe there's definite connection there. Uh, has anybody ever taken the opportunity maybe on one of those ley lines to uh, put a station camera and just let it roll and see in every single snap what might show up? Well, we're in the process of trying to get that done. Unfortunately, since the powers that be at, at Hera are, uh, are in charge of being you know, the cemetery, the people can visit the cemetery. As far as putting equipment out there, I don't know if we're going to be allowed to do that. Um, you know, the, the, the whole this whole sighting scenario over the past couple of years has just really ruffled some feathers at the uh, <laughs> at the airport, I and uh, they've been they've been the the uh, management of the airport plus some of the carrier supervisors. I've made it quite clear that, you know, they don't want reports going out and they've been pretty tough about it. I mean, they've been threatening termination wow. to employees. So, um, but despite that, we still have been getting reports and, um, you know, I think these people are, are feel that it's important that it gets out. Uh, and, uh, they, they've come forth. Of course, we're, you know, we're, we're confidential, you know, we do not put this stuff out to the public. So, uh, yeah, so I, I do believe there's something important about that cemetery. And as far as putting camera, in fact, I was, I was in my thread today discussing this very thing with one of my, one of the investigators on our team. And he's going in there. He's going to the cemetery this weekend, this coming weekend. And uh, we're going to see what we can do. Yeah, I mean even if he is allowed to just have a little body camera just at the cemetery and just let it roll and just tune in, maybe with the intent of somebody showing up, mm -hmm. they have a message or something, maybe that helps. Very fascinating. So it's more <clears throat> above the cemetery and some areas around it than further out in the city. Is that the hotspot then? That has been lately. In the mm -hmm. past year or so, that has been the hotspot. Now, there have been other areas of the airport where there have been multiple sightings. Uh, I think all in all, we've had close to 20 sightings around the airport since October 2019. But some of the neighborhoods around the airport have been busy as well. Uh, and there is a very good possibility that some of the some of these settings had some extraterrestrial or ultra-terrestrial involvement. Uh, I had a woman who lived out in Rosemont, who was a teacher, and she was, um, she had a restless night. She walked to a, a local park in the middle of the night. It was lit up and that she didn't mind being there at night. But as she watched, there was a building there that had a light suspended above the, the building. And as she watched it, she saw this winged being show up as well as an alien gray and two hu female humanoids of some type, which she really didn't understand. But uh, at one point, there was a bright flash of blue light and the, uh, the gray and the two female humanoids disappeared. And then this winged being just took off and flew away. 
So. Well, these are flashes of light coming and going, and all of a sudden something yeah. here and the next moment not. I think that's typical for you know UFO carrier ships. And yeah, you know, and you know, I've talked to several people, mm -hmm. and, I, and I have noticed this as well. There seems to be portal or transport activity involving blue lights. I don't, I don't understand. I don't know, but just because of the blue lights, but. Um, some of the experiencers I have talked to with entirely different situations have mentioned blue lights as far as a bright blue light and something shows up and disappears and vice versa, you know. So uh, is that what's going on here? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, we did have another incident at the cemetery about a year and a half ago where one of the cargo workers was uh, out on a smoke break uh, looking right across the street from the, um, the cemetery and a oval shaped UFO showed up very bright and he watched it and noticed a humanoid type being ascended up into it. So, you know, first thing I, I'm trying to find out from this guy who this thing have wings. He said, well, I don't know. I couldn't tell any wings, but, uh, yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of strange things going on and a lot of it has to do with that cemetery. So, you know, yeah, this is, you know, this, this is just another Avenue we're going to have to explore, but, uh, you know, we, we have looked into the occult. We have looked into summoning a lot of other things. Um, you know, the summoning is something that I have associated personally with a lot of these, uh, winged humanoid sightings throughout the country uh over the years um just like the mothman of point pleasant i believe that was a summoning i think that thing was summoned from another dimension by a strong indigenous spirit there at point pleasant there's an area where some many of these sightings were seen which was the west virginia ordinance works a lot of people called it the tnt plant and what happened was that this be this was an area where uh you know young folks and such would hang out now this is back in the late 60s uh they would hang out there and i i think this strong indigenous energy was uh upset by all the activity and such and i think it may have summoned some this mothman mm -hmm. uh as a guardian or a sentinel or something and that's just the that's just the impression i get so um you know, the first thing I'm thinking is, well, what's going on in Chicago? Is this a summoning? You know, it didn't really, it really didn't turn out that way. The evidence that we received, we just couldn't find anything that was summoning anything. You know, I, you know, we'd go into different areas where it occurred and we just weren't getting that type of feedback or that kind of um, signature or spirit signature. So, you know, Did I stand, uh, understood you correctly that there was some, you presumed some kind of summoning from a, like a Native American spirit? Possibly. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Well, as far as what happened in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, I'm quite sure it was Native American. I had gone there. I had done EVP work there at that facility many times. And I had been with people as well. And some of the EVPs that we have received from there are stark, very well defined voice. Uh, but the, the sense I got when I'd go in there, was that it was Native American. I, I, I believe it was possibly a Shawnee spirit. You know, that area in particular was the site of a lot of uh, uh, tribal warring, settler fighting with, with, uh, with the indigenous. Um, there have been several, several tribes that have gone in and out of there over the time. You know, that happens a lot here in the East. Um, and it happened a lot in Chicago. You know, I, I, when I started doing some of the research last night, after I, you know, we we got some some information from you. Uh, we found out that there had been at least twelve to twenty two tribes that had taken up residence around the Chicago area in the past three centuries. So, you know, there's got to be an imprint there somewhere. So, right. you know, now we're starting to fig trying to figure out if that has anything to do with what we're experiencing. Well, I was fascinated about these winged beings because um, a shaman which lived here in the Sedona area now um, deceased, he talked about their winged humanoids here 
and he saw them energetically flying in and out of reality, uh, some off of Sundown Mountain and some where there is a resort right now in Secret Canyon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that fascinating. He said, well, you just have to look at the Native American tradition. They talk about uh, winged humanoids all the time. And he pointed me out to some pectoglyphs and uh, pictographs. And there were actually some of these beings. They were not like the Thunderbirds. They, he showed me the distinction between the Thunderbirds, which I personally think might be some UFOs, you know, so mm -hmm. with thunder and clap and lightning and all that. Mm -hmm. But he said, look at the face. And that's what you mentioned earlier, that there was a face smaller, but with glowing red eyes. Um, and in these um, depictions, there were, I mean, you just have to look, one just has to look at the, the internet and look at winged beings, Native American or pictographs or petroglyphs. You can see a tons of those mm -hmm. and all shapes of kind of winged depictions, some with feathers, some streamlined, um, some bigger, some smaller, some with very long heads and definitely not humanoid and one of them um i find fascinating because he said they were pretty tall right mm -hmm. and one of them the deers are not very small so when native americans um hunt a deer they picked up a deer and then here next to it was a human hunter and then there was this tall beam and i thought well that's really interesting so it really confirms what you were describing about how tall these things are mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, <laughs> from the very beginning, we've literally been grasping at straws and trying to figure out what all this is. Now, you know, a colleague and I, uh, who's a friend of yours as well, we, we've been looking into this metaphysically more so now than before uh, as to what this very well may be. And I, I, do, I do believe that there's an ultra terrestrial type situation with this um and uh you know that's where we're going to that's where we're going to concentrate a lot of our investigation from here on out uh, uh maybe get more psychic more metaphysical evidence as opposed to finding physical evidence which i just don't think we're going to really be able to find so uh yeah that's where we're at right now well, maybe one of your viewers could be very courageous and when they have a, a sighting or in, maybe encourage your viewers to say, if you see one, ask, why do you show yourself to me? Why are you here? What would you like to accomplish? Because as you said, they might have an agenda why they're showing themselves to certain people. And um, yeah, maybe by, my guiding ones always say, if you do not ask questions, you do not get answers. So right. ask a lot of questions, 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 questions. And that's what they poke me all the time to ask questions. Uh, and one of the questions I have in regard of these beings, because you describe them as humanoid with wings, um, could that have anything to do with Egypt and the hybrids? You know, we have the, the bots there, which showed themselves to be in many hybrid form, but who says that they were not also created? Because I was having a, a meditation uh, circle at home in Germany, and uh, one of the participants there was talking to my best uh, girlfriend, Carola, at the time and said, do you remember when we make them, you know, chimeras, their mixed beings, when mm -hmm. we made them? And I said, what do you talk about? You made them. Well, he said, well, you were not there, but she was there and we were in a group and we were, you know, working with uh, human DNA and doing all sorts of experiments. And then we let them loose on this earth and they were very advanced because we created them. Said, mm -hmm. hmm. I never di dived into it deeper, but when I'm hearing you talk and I'm wondering back to that scenario and wondering whether that's maybe created beings for a certain purpose. Well, you know, I, uh, I I wrote a book titled Alien Disclosure, and um, I, I kind of got into a little bit of that with Chimeras. I personally believe that when these gods, and I do believe these were gods uh, to the people who were, were living there at the time in, in Egypt. Right. And uh, I think these beings literally showed themselves 
uh, as chimeras to kind of calm the people because these were creatures that they were familiar with. Uh, you know, it was a humanoid, a humanoid being, but the head of a, a crocodile or the head of a, uh, a falcon or whatever it would have been. I, I, I think it, they, that the, the people that were there could associate with that as opposed to if they showed the, the real form to them. Very and, uh, interesting idea. Yeah, that, Very that, just, that just seems to me to be, you know, just maybe off the, off the cuff, but possibly the re, a reason for like a control or to, uh, you know, to, to have these people believe in them or to follow them. So, you know, there is so much about Egypt that we just do not know. I mean, even the, the timeline, the history and such there, you know, it, it, it's, we just really don't know what had happened. And, uh, you know, I, I love, I love studying about Egypt and, um, it, it, I'm just fascinated every time I get into something new, but a lot of times when you do discover something in, in rough, you know, get into some of the history that's available, it kind of mimics a lot of what we're, we're getting now, which just like these winged beings, uh, or even if you talk about the Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia and the Anunnaki right and that and uh, it, it, it there is some type of connection there somehow right so and they uh, also uh portray in some uh hieroglyph art this uh wing beings too mm -hmm. i think they have a lot of those wing beings as well wondering whether that has something to do with that very well may it very well may you know i mean this is all an enigma at this point and um you know or are, are they are these beings showing themselves as an original form? Are they showing themselves as something from a previous time? I don't know. Uh, you know, hopefully we can start communicating with these beings uh, to a degree where we start getting answers. And that's something we're working on. We, we are, we're very seriously working on that now. Uh, you know, we, we've kind of gotten out of the box and kind of <laughs> gotten into a new <laughs> a new way of looking at this phenomena. And, you know, it's gotten to that point where we, we almost have to do that. And what I love about your work is that you are so encouraging to people. Like you remember when you were alone and uh, nobody really, you had nobody to talk to. And yeah. I had a client who just had her 60th birthday and was several times a doctor and never ever had any chance to talk to everybody in these 60 years about her experience. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of sad, and you give a safe haven for people who want to contact you and to talk about their experience and catalog them, and you're not doing further research on them, and it is really validating for such people and such witnesses, and I thank you for it in the name of everybody who had experiences ever, and you're going to work with us in the future, because I think you're really the go-to person, and um, you encourage people. That is absolutely great and so necessary. And in our previous uh, private talk, you were also um, mentioning that you're giving sessions also to youngsters and yeah. encourage them to utilizing their gift appropriately because you were talking something about summoning. And it reminded me of one show um, I did with Vision of Terror where a young lady was like a portal and she was drawing things into her after using the Ouija board and then it never stopped and I had to train her a little bit how to use her gifts and you were doing the same thing, right? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. Doing youngsters too. Well, you know, a lot of times when I get a client and, and many times it's family and uh, uh, <laughs> another thing, a lot of times they're twin sisters or twin brothers. Uh, it, it's a, it's a strange variable, but most of the times they have kids and they possess what I believe is, are being beak are beacons. They can actually draw in energy. Uh, and these kids are experiencing the same thing. And, uh, you know, I look back at what a, I was like when I was younger that I had no one to talk to or to explain to me. So that just becomes part of what I do. I'm working with the parents and others, but uh, when I do that, I, I, I feel I need to also work with the children because, you know, they're a part of this thing as well. So, uh, yeah, I have taken a lot of time working with young kids. Wonderful. Um, 
So let's come back to some of the other creatures you were <laughs> having experiences with. And one of the most uh, fascinating part of your storytelling was about one person. I love to when people talk about their personal experience because it's so authentic and you are one of the most authentic people I know. So you were describing some encounter with some Bigfoot. Can yeah. you tell us about that again? Yeah, 19, 1981, I was, uh, I was out fishing at a place I used to go fishing all the time. And this was near Sykesville, Maryland. Um, and I uh, was actually standing in the river in hip waders. Well, I was in chest waders, actually. And I saw this thing stand up in the weeds across on the other side of the river. And as I watched it, I, I really didn't know what I was looking at, you know. I, I had not done any type of cryptid or Bigfoot investigations to that point. Uh, but I watched this thing started walking to my left and walked out of the weeds. And this thing was huge. It was about eight foot in height. All, a lot of hair, definitely male. I could see the genitalia on this thing. And uh, it was just massive. But it looked human. For the most part, I mean, the face looked human. It looked like what I considered a Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. uh, it had the real thick brow ridge, uh, somewhat conical head. But you know, it, it was also making like a ticking sound. Like I, from what I found out later, it may have been gnashing its teeth, uh, maybe like a nervous tick or something. I don't know. It just didn't maybe or understand maybe what like a looking. threat, like don't come too close. Well, th that may very well be too, because I wasn't going anywhere near it. And uh, <laughs> we were about 40 or 50 foot apart, so we were fairly close. And it, it, it turned and looked right at me. We locked eyes. And I, the thing I'm thinking is, I don't know what this is. And I'm not doing any, but I'm not, you know, I wouldn't hurt it. I would never hurt something like that. Or if I had a gun or anything on me, I would have never took a shot at it. And we, we watched each other for about 10, 10 seconds. And then it just turned around and walked swiftly up into the woods. And I, uh, you know, I had, I literally made a report. I made a police report as soon as I walked out of the river and, um, it was, it was just a crazy situation and I just didn't understand what I was dealing with, but that's where I really became interested in cryptids. And there had been a situation in the same, in that town about nine years earlier than that of what they called the Sykesville monster. And this thing was literally a Bigfoot like creature. And people said it had a human face on it that was breaking into homes and garages and chicken pens and whole nine yards up and down the river. So this, this community was an, an African American community. And, but I was, you know, after I had my encounter, I was very fortunate enough to be able to work with somebody. I was working with somebody at my, my job who lived in that area. And most of the people were either relatives or very close friends of his. So I got the opportunity to investigate and, and talk to the original witnesses of that flap. And I, I, I actually discovered other witnesses as well. So I was hooked. You know, I, I figured, well, I saw this thing. These people seen this thing. And, uh, it, you know, I didn't know much about it because I, you know, I had recently moved into the area. So I didn't know the whole story about this Sykesville monster, the lore behind it or whatever it was. But I quickly became acclimated with what had happened. So, uh, yeah, at that point, I was hooked on the cryptid, and, um, you know, that's where it really started for me. Well, um, I got interested into Hopi culture for many different reasons, and uh, one of the things I found astounding that in one of the um, museums up there in uh, Hopi territory, there was some, uh, something about Masao, which mm -hmm. then I met somebody else who was like an ambassador of the Hopi and um, he had a translator. And so she talked about Masao a lot. And what she talked about was not like what you find on the internet or the typical stories about a skeleton man, but they described Masao as like the Bigfoot type scenario. Mm -hmm. And I, it somehow it drew me in. And um, so I asked her to show me or give me an encounter and 
before I even could count to three, there was this being standing in front of me with a very distinct smile. And I think in one of your interviews, you were mentioning that too. And I'm not a hunter, so I don't know how this masking substance smells like, but to me, it smells like a uh, month's rotting garbage. Yeah. And it, the being had a um, magenta purplish glow to it mm -hmm. energetically. It was very friendly. I felt a connection there. I, it was benign. It was not negative whatsoever. And I had two further encounters with that, but it's only in the inner encounters, not outer encounters mm -hmm. like you had one. But mm -hmm. then I researched a little bit and I heard that Masao, when he shows up, is more like a warning sign about humans not behaving appropriately. And in one of the interviews, you were also mentioning that these beings going in and out of reality, like the winged people, the masked men, um, and also Masao, that sometimes they show up and then they disappear. Yeah. Um, but in your case, it was walking away from you, right? Just normally walking. Yeah, it, it didn't disappear. It walked up into the woods. Now, you know, I saw the, the links that you sent about the Masao and the Kachina doll that was uh, the representation of that, the Hopi mm -hmm. uh, representation. It's interesting because I I have worked with a lot of the Navajo on, you know, in the Navajo residence, the mm -hmm. Navajo reservation in uh, New Mexico and Arizona. And I've associated with a lot of the people who actually did cryptid investigations in that area. So I kind of knew the history, but the Masao thing I never heard of before. And uh, it was interesting when you sent that link over to us with the uh, with the Kachina doll. I, it, it was it looked very much like a representation of one of these beings. So uh, is, is that what we're dealing with? I don't know. You know, it very well could be, uh, but it, it's going to take more investigation. But I, I, I appreciate you doing that because I, I think we're it's giving us another avenue to research this. Well, I only know that Masao um, helped the uh, Hopi, you know, from one world to another. There were several helpers and long stories when you um, read those uh, reports, what Masao stands for. But right. there, I think there are two Masao figures, one the skeleton man and one more the right. big god. But both were supposed to be the guardian from a lower world to a higher world, which we are supposed to be in right now. Yeah. So um maybe this is the time to be mindful again when we have so many uh, bigfoot sightings to be mindful about our environment who knows because you mentioned that they are getting yeah. more and more and more did i understand that right oh yeah i mean cryptid all types of cryptic creatures the the canine like creatures uh uh and, and, you know just a wide variety of strange humanoids as well um you know, I, I don't know if it's all connected. I, I, I seem to believe it is, um, you know, and as far as uh, ultra-terrestrial activity being associated with these cryptids, I, I think there's a very strong possibility that it is. I mean, it's something that much of the community didn't talk about a lot 20 years ago, but is becoming more, more mainstream now. People are starting to open up and starting to, you know, realize that you know we haven't found a body yet maybe these things are moving in and out of or these different dimensions you know and uh maybe that's why we haven't found any real real physical evidence of it um but like i told you earlier i think there you know as far as the bigfoot goes i believe there are indigenous uh indigenous yeah. tribes or groups i of can them, imagine like, yeah, like the upper, upper, uh, uh, well, Pacific Northwest and down in Florida and around the, the Gulf. I believe that I believe that'd be true because many times when people see these things, they see either a male or female or two males or, or even a family with juveniles. In where I live at here in mid, the Mid Atlantic and even the East Coast and the upper Midwest, most of the sightings are singular beings. And many times they just suddenly show up now is that because they're you know an ultra terrestrial that they they're able to move in and out do they cloak somehow i mean i think there's a there's strong evidence that these may very well be some type of supernatural being or with supernatural abilities so and i i think most cryptids can be put in that same category 
that they're just not necessarily indigenous. They may be flesh and blood, but they're able to move in and out of realities or more so dimensions. Right. Um, talking about dimensions, what do you think is happening on the planet? Would you say that there is a vibration race going on so that people have more uh, spiritual capacities and more extrasensory perceptions? Um, do you believe that that's why, not just because or it's more common knowledge now that certain things exist between heaven and earth more than we ever thought there would be? Uh, and it's more common knowledge now, thanks to people like you, where people start sharing more. Or do mm -hmm. you think there's also the possibility that people are opening up, awakening to a extrasensory perception globally so that there is more sightings going on now? Or maybe even the reversal that, you know, people should be a couple more of things. Of it could be a couple of things. I think people perceive better than they used to or they're allowing themselves to open up more to be able to receive something, you know, they see it and, and, and instead of just pushing it away and ignoring it, they're, they're becoming more interested in as to why this is being seen. Uh, as far as these beings moving in and out, I think it's maybe a vibrational thing. Uh, you know, this is something that's always fascinated me. Even it goes back to the, um, to uh, alien abduction where, someone seems to be able to move between the walls of a craft or you know are, are is are their molecular structure changing or the vibration changing as to where their their solid form can move through these other solid forms um you know i've thought about that a long time i mean I, I, and i've talked to several ufologists about that over time and it seems that a lot of them are starting to believe that. I, and now as far as what's been going on uh, dimensional wise, I think that's very possible as well. Well, um, talking about abductions, I believe there are two kinds of abductions. One are, are abductions where the human body is uplifted into a higher state somewhere up, maybe mm -hmm. in the craft. But then there are also abductions where just the energy body, the spirit body is taken. For example, the body where we normally do remote viewing in. And well, I think you're right about that. Energetically, uh, you know, manipulated and uh, then be brought back and integrated in the physical form. Um, so I find your research absolutely fascinating. One more thing I want to angle back into and that's mm -hmm. um about people who have had encounters what to do with it you said most people were not afraid that's great especially when we get more encouraged and asking who are you what you're doing why you're doing it why do you show yourself to me and why 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 um but also some people of course naturally are scared you're mentioning these um canine huge tall ginormous beings and we talked uh, about the maybe association that writers were downloading things from higher perceptions uh, and therefore some of these sightings were similar to what has been seen on tv not the other way around right um so my question is you said you were doing something to your own energy field to be strong and not to be scared tell right. us a little bit about that well Practical advice what do you do you know i um you know, I, I, I try not to, um, <laughs> when I talk to somebody who's had an encounter, and it doesn't matter what the encounter is, I mean, if it's cryptid, extraterrestrial, or whatever, you know, I, I try to explain to them that, you know, you, you've, you, know you, you need to just sit back or step back and look at what happened and ask yourself, why did it happen? You know, we talked about the, the alien abductors. They... They have evolved over time. I mean, I have found that, you know, first, when you start talking alien abductions, you were talking about people being uh, lifted up in the craft, uh, you know, uh, you know, a physical craft. Right. Then it, it then it started that started evolving into where people were actually being abducted in their bedroom at night or and, and taken on board or taken to another location, uh, either for 
experimentation or whatever they believe may have happened to them. But more I recently, had a years, lot of those I could talk I to bet. you about. <laughs> I bet. And uh, but more and more, it has come, and I have actually seen this because I had a client who was um, she was very young. She was like 26 or 27. And she was losing pregnancies in her the end of her first trimester. She lost six children. And oh my God. They were all they they were all seen on ultrasound and everything. And she was sure that these beings were literally taking them from her. And we put a uh, we put a video recorder by her bed one evening and it actually picked up her levitating off the bed. No kidding. I'm and getting sit, chills while you were it, talking And sitting about up. It. And, um, and she said she was sure she was having encounters even when she wasn't pregnant. So they were visiting her. And we did capture this. And it was bizarre. Uh, the, the boyfriend was absolutely knocked out. Uh, the, she had several dogs. They were knocked out. So, you know, I, I think more so than not now in recent times, these abductions are done more like a bilocation, like it's the body stays and then the non-physical part or the soul or life force uh, is taken away, is taken to whatever location they want to go. But it, it, it's the same result as if the actual body was taken. So that seems to be one of the, the newer evolved types of abductions. Now, who knows what's going to come up next down the line? You know, a lot of times when I've talked to folks about abductions and they tell us, well, it, was, it would be like a, uh, a group of grays or something like that would, that would actually do the process. But, you know, more recent amount of different species, even uh, they say, well, there's a human, a reptilian, a gray, a taller gray, maybe an insectoid or this and that. And it's a whole, it's a whole group of people or a whole group of people, a whole group of beings. beings. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that there has definitely been an evolution as to um, the whole scenario. Now, is that, is that going on because of their needs? I don't know. But it, ha it has changed, considerably changed. Well, I can only say from one of my encounters where I was waking up on a ship, uh, beings were looking over me, typical grays, but they were friendly, calming me down and said, we have on behalf of the white ones, they look like huge white um, beings, which introduced themselves as from Aldebaran, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. And they said, we have to do something and cleanse your blood because otherwise you wouldn't survive long enough with your vibration rate. So we have to um, cleanse your bloodstream. I still have the marks on my leg where they had certain operation tools insert, um, inserted. And then um, after everything was done, they fed me well, well, and said, see you next time. But while they were doing <laughs> this blood exchange, I was looking around and I definitely wasn't alone. There were a yeah. lot of tables. But the atmosphere was not one of scare, but more of uh, curiosity and gratefulness because I know I was grateful because I got help before the time I was sick all the time. And after that encounter, not so much. Certain things just disappeared. Yeah, so that, for my part, I was grateful. Your scenario is very similar to a lot of the same type of scenarios. People have been healed. They have been... Um, they have been experimentation on them. Like me, I have a scoop mark on my stomach that I've had ever since I was young. So I'm quite sure I was taken at some point, uh, but I don't know. I don't remember or know anything about it, but um, I have had, I have had uh, an abduction years ago where I was taken by three tall gray type beings. Um, and I had another encounter in April this year, though, I still don't know what happened there. I know it was the same beings. I was taken to a, a different location, but I don't know what the significance was. I don't remember much of it. You know, it's going to be like one of these things, like with others experience when this happens to them, it'll be, it'll be 
uh, it'll be staying inside of their, their themselves until it's regressed or it just comes out. Uh, they're reminded of something and they'll remember it. And that's, right. I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen with me. Eventually. Well, if you ever want to try, I'm happy to facilitate a, you know, a regression with you if you are. Oh, interested. really? Yeah, you know, no I get problem. people ask me about that all the time. And I, I tell them, look, I, I'm not going to suggest that you get a regression, but if you really want to do it, then, then go for it. You know, I, I have, I have thought about having a regressions done, but I've been a little hesitant about it because I'm more afraid of what I'm going to find out <laughs> as opposed to what I don't know what happened. I like to know what's, what happened before, you know, something like that and go into a regression, but it would be interesting. I'm quite sure. Well, you know, there are ways what um, we don't know doesn't agitate us, I'm sure. Right. You're true. But That's right. When we know, uh, we can uh, deal with it in a very conscious way, and it doesn't mm. have to be traumatic at all. When I do, for example, past life regression, or better said, parallel life regression, and there's a really heartfelt incident, let's say rape or whatnot, then um, we are taking that incident and bringing it to a new level so that there pain or the, imp the negative imprint is not harmful anymore and you can operate like on a clean slate from there on out. Mm. So um, it doesn't have to be a negative aftertaste. And in my scenario, how I do it, you would still be part of your full senses. You would just allow yourself to see and sense and know and maybe telepathically ask questions because the key is we can go in time and space coordinates specifically and know your remote viewers. So you know how that goes. Yeah, Ultimately, absolutely. you're going back in that time and space coordinate where that happened. Maybe just as an observer in spirit and checking things out and maybe telepathically asking me a question. Hey, what are you doing with me down there? You know, what's your agenda? <laughs> <laughs> well, I may, I may take you up on that at some point. I, uh, I, I'm, you know, I am curious. Uh, I have been a witness to several past life regressions, uh, and uh, they, you know, some of the things I've learned because of those regressions is is, is very interesting. Uh, my whole my whole sense of uh, you know being taken to another level when you pass and your life force is taken into another level, which I consider to be like a way station, basically that you're there until. You're taking someplace someplace else to inhabit another body. But right. I do I do entirely believe in it. I believe that you know we we can have reincarnation, that we can have past lives. And in fact, I believe I believe I know of one that it that happened to me. And um, you know, and the only reason why I believe that is because of a situation to where I ended up, ended up going to the place where I was actually had a profound encounter when I was alive at that time. And it just flashed, flashed up front before me. And uh, I, it was, it was so profound that I believe that was what happened. So there's well, that. I could talk with you for hours and hours. <laughs> so many interesting things, like from one to another, to another, to another, it just like keeps on going. Um, but I have the sneaking suspicion that I'm going to have several more shows with you if you are willing to come. Oh, absolutely. I would, I would love to talk further about your experience with remote viewing and again, past lives and, uh, you know, crystals and how we can uh, access them and help us into our research in the spiritual realms. There's so many things. So, uh, Lon Strickler, I'm going to um, have all your links, books, who, folks, if you're interesting, 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 interesting books written, blog, and uh, link to your website in case you want to contact Lon Strickler and uh, divulge some of your own experiences as witness to some monsters or winged men or mothmen or Bigfoot or many other encounters and heartily encourage you because you are definitely in the good hands of Lon and his team. So thank you again for coming and sharing your precious time with us today. I'm really, really grateful. Oh, I thank you for having me, Claudia. It was my pleasure. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.